The following is a presentation of the University of St. Thomas with campuses in Minneapolis and St. Paul, Minnesota. Hello everyone and thank you for joining us for the St. Thomas Alumni Relations webinar series. My name is Jenna Johnson and I'm a program manager in the Alumni Relations Office. The webinar will last approximately 30 minutes. The last five minutes of the webinar will be used as a questions and answer session with Dr. Roxanne Pritchard. It is now my pleasure to introduce you to today's speaker, Dr. Roxanne Pritchard. Dr. Pritchard is an Associate Professor of Neuroscience and Psychology and the Scientific Director of the Center for College Sleep at the University of St. Thomas. An award-winning researcher, speaker, and author, Dr. Pritchard has spent the last 10 years studying how college students sleep. Her TEDx talk, Addressing Our Children's Sleep Debt, was featured in the lecture series, Transforming Education. Her research has been summarized in a variety of national media outlets, including Time, US News and World Report, PBS NewsHour, Huffington Post, ABC News, and USA Today, among others. So without further ado, I give you Dr. Roxanne Pritchard. Hi, well thank you so much for joining me for today's webinar. I'll do my best not to put you to sleep this afternoon over lunch hour. So sleep and Elvis have actually been long-standing interest of mine. I started studying sleep at UW-Madison in the late 90s when I started graduate school and I haven't looked back since. And as far as Elvis goes, I was born the week Elvis died. So that's actually 40 years today, almost to the hour that um, we've been on earth without Elvis. So as a sleep researcher, it's been really interesting for me to kind of look back on his life, on his long decline, and to see kind of what elements have contributed to that. So I know that sleep is a, a topic of conversation for many, many people. It's one of the things we struggle with so much in our society. And I'm hoping to give you just a little bit of insight today about what sleep is, what it's for, how we work it, what is it doing, and what can we do to improve our own sleep. And I think looking through the lens of the king might be an interesting way to do so. So we'll start with what is sleep. So sleep is a um, stage that our brain goes through it's required for life. If we don't have sleep, we will actually die. So sleep is required for life. The Victorians thought of sleep as a near-death experience. And from looking at it, we spend about eight hours of our life on average each day not moving, not responding to the world around us. It wasn't until the, 18, um, the early 1900s when we could measure electricity that we had a better understanding that during sleep, the brain is actually quite active. So we have two main um, areas of sleep. We have slow wave sleep, non-REM sleep, here in the early part of the night. And this is a sleep that's so deep, so delicious, we're not really responding to outside stimuli very much at all. This is when our body does a lot of restoration processes. This is when there's a lot of human growth hormone release. This is when a lot of the endocrine regulation um, happens. So this slow wave sleep is truly a restorative one, and young kids and babies have the most of it. Second half of the night, we have more REM sleep. So that's in green here. In REM sleep, the brain becomes very active, so active the Europeans called it paradoxical sleep, because we looked like we are paralyzed, yet our brains are buzzing as if we are awake and attending the most exciting event of our lives. So just kind of want to illustrate what that looks like. This is kind of a visual representation of the EEG during slow wave sleep. And this is when we're not responding. This is when the body's kind of repairing a lot of harm um, from just kind of the days, wears, and tears in its body and in the brain. And lo and behold, this is what REM sleep looks like. The brain becomes very active. It's very emotional. It's kind of processing memories, processing what we've learned in the day. And the brain really needs both of these stages of sleep to function at its best part. So there's no one most important part of sleep. We need both the slow wave non-REM sleep to restore our body and then the um, hours of the REM sleep to keep us aware and to keep us processing information. So what controls when we sleep? Four things to consider. One is your what's called homeostatic drive. How much do we need sleep? And this we can think of as almost like an um, hourglass. 
you cannot stay awake past the time you are very sleepy. So if we are um, awake for 16, 20, um, 24 hours, we start to get very tired, so tired that we'll fall asleep if we need to. It doesn't matter what we're doing. We could be driving. Nobody plans to take a nap on the interstate. It just our brains make us sleep. So when you are nodding off like this, falling asleep, it's a sign that your body is so short on something required for life, it takes away the keys of consciousness for you. Right? So being that sleepy that you're nodding off is a sign that you're actually having really bad insufficient sleep. So that's the first thing, our homeostatic sleep drive. How long have we been awake? And our brains can basically do two hours of wake for every one hour of sleep. So after we've been pushing for 16, 20, 24 hours, our brains perform like they're legally drunk if we've been awake that long. The second thing to consider is our circadian rhythm. This means like your 24-hour rhythm, about a day. And we are creatures of the day. We are diurnal creatures. Some of us are more um, night owls. Some of us are more morning people. And this is something that uh, is controlled genetically. So you can't turn a morning person into a night person. Um, we can do our best to work with the situations that we have um, using kind of light, maybe a little bit of caffeine. But we are basically our genetic code. Some of us are morning people, some aren't. And that circadian rhythm is important to sort of synchronize with our homeostatic drive. So ideally, after you've been awake for about 16 hours, is that time when your circadian rhythm kicks in and you're feeling like it's nighttime, your body temperature drops, you feel more tired. So what I work with college students a lot is synchronizing these two things so that when you've been awake for a long time, it's also your body's time to signal that it's time to fall asleep. If you take a three hour, what's called, or used to be called a disco nap, late in the evening or an after, late afternoon, early evening, you are going to pipe back that homeostatic sleep drive and it's gonna be harder to fall asleep. So smart humans that we are, we love to manipulate and try to hack these things. This is a beautiful system that worked for millions and millions of years. Um, and for the longest time, we look to the environment for zeitgeibers. That's a German word for time giver. So for vast history of human and primate life on Earth, that zeitgeiber was the sun. How much light did we see during the day? Um, when the sun comes up, the world gets warmer and brighter, we can see better, the birds kick in, we hear more things, and then the whole thing happens reverse at nighttime. But in the last 100 years with electricity, we've kind of radically shifted into a world where those, that primary zeitgeiber is no longer as important. And the last thing humans have done to kind of throw a wrench in the system is drugs, right? So humans have been doing psychoactive drugs for as long as we've been able to ferment fruit or learn that tea leaves or coffee beans can actually manipulate us. And the last 100 years, again, has been a, a, a revolution in, in pharmacy. So most of the drugs that we do, either for um, taste, like coffee or tea, uh, recreationally or medicinally impact sleep in some way. And we'll look at Elvis, and this is definitely a topic that we'll talk about in more detail with Elvis. So I want to focus on that circadian rhythm. It's controlled by this tiny little part in the brain in the hypothalamus called the suprachiasmatic nucleus. And this is a really important part because it is the one that tells the rest of our body's um, sort of cells how to function, what genes we should be making at what time of day, and that's our circadian rhythm. So I'm going to show you what happens if you take out or lesion this little part of the brain. So this is an example of this happening in a hamster. This is activity and rest for 24 hours, another activity and rest. And as you can see, the hamster is quite the nocturnal creature, active during the night, sleeps during the day, maybe has a nap here or there, an activity period, but is really regular until he has that surgery to remove this part of the brain, and then all of a sudden, his sleep gets fragmented. It's still the same amount of sleep, so the homeostatic drive isn't um, disrupted, but the circadian rhythm is. This part might look familiar to you. We'll, we'll get back to that in a, in a bit. 
So how much sleep do we need? This is probably the number one question I get when I tell people I'm a sleep researcher. And the simple answer is you need to sleep as much as you need to to wake up naturally. So the idea of an alarm clock is very strange to me. Like, right? We know when we're finished drinking water because we're not thirsty. We know when we are finished going to the bathroom because we're done. Um, likewise, sleep is over when we wake up naturally. So you're getting enough sleep if you don't need an alarm clock, you don't feel tired during the day, you don't need an infusion of coffee to keep you up. And on average, and this varies quite a bit between people, but on average, for newborns, that's 15 to 18 hours. And young children can be at least 10 up to 13 or 15 hours, depending on your age. I work a lot with adolescents, both in high school and college, and um, we have a society right now that's really crunching adolescent sleep, and that's showing up in their mental health. But adults, on average, need between seven and nine. Um, when I'm well, when I'm not pregnant, um, I need about seven and a half hours of sleep. When I'm sick, I can sleep as much as 14, 15 hours in a day, and when I was pregnant, I needed about 10 and a half. So your sleep needs are going to vary depending on what you've been up to, how well your body is, but on average, it is somewhere between seven to nine. Sure, there's the occasional person that's a short sleeper who might need only six hours or less, um, and some people are um, sleep a lot. They have a lot of sleep, nine 10, 11, 12 hours. Bad news is if you're in the short sleeper or the long sleeper group, you actually have a, a shortened lifespan on average. So most healthy adults need between seven and nine hours of sleep. So next question, how does that work in our society? So we have shifted to a round the clock lifestyle where food is always available, entertainment is always available, lights are coming in everywhere. You can chat with anybody anytime. You can buy pants with Amazon anytime or anywhere. So we have just in a, in a generation shifted from one where the TV station went off air at, at night um, to one where there's constant sources for us pulling us awake. And that has led to a great word called somnorexia. So the ability to sleep, but choosing not to, choosing not to get enough of your sleep. And in the last 100 years, we have decreased the amount of sleep we've gotten on average by 20%. So we've really reduced our average sleep time. Used to be people would spend 10 hours in bed a night. Doesn't that sound delicious? All right, so what are the consequences of sleep deprivation? They are pretty bad, actually, and we've kind of become immune to them. So first thing is sleep is for the brain, by the brain. And that's one of the first places it shows up as deficits. We're worse at making decisions. We have slowed reaction times, worse ability to sort of contemplate the consequences of our actions, which leads to more risk-taking, more accidents. Habitually sleepy drivers have nine times the crash rate of drivers who are well-rested. And that's not saying they fell asleep at the wheel. That is just saying that their, their reaction time is slower. Their ability to make split-second decisions, can I merge or not, is reduced. Also, we have a, uh, a frightening kind of compilation of, of physiological consequences. Our insulin um, is dysregulated when we're sleep deprived. So if you're chronically not getting enough sleep, you're kind of putting yourselves at risk for diabetes. And it's a, it's a big of a risk factor as obesity, right? So not getting enough sleep predisposes you to diabetes. And for me, I feel it's a lot easier to, to control sleep than necessarily the amount of sugar or food that you're getting in a day. It also leads to increased blood pressure, which is a big problem for Elvis. Weight gain, which was observed um, and well-documented the last few years of his life. And uh, immune problems. So our immune system begins to kind of shut down resources when we're not getting enough sleep, making it more likely we'll get colds, flus, and also contributing to autoimmune disorders. Some of the factors I'm most interested in is the impact of sleep on mental health. So we see a lot of students who are not getting enough sleep showing up with signs of depression, with signs of ADHD, with signs of anxiety, not necessarily connecting the idea that shortened sleep can lead you to a psychological state where you're more prone to anxiety and depression. And sometimes what you just need is a, is a night or a consistent lifestyle of sufficient sleep, and that really helps you kind of modulate your life. Also, 
and this is something we'll see with the king, increased drug abuse. And a lot of the drug abuse, sadly, is just trying to get the ability to stay awake when you want to, fall asleep when you want to. If we look at the kind of consequences of sleep loss, they have an enormous impact on our economy. Um, sleep shows up so many different ways in the top 15 causes of lost work time. So number one, sleep disorders. There's absenteeism, where you just don't show up for work, and presenteeism, which is a great term for you're at work, but not really at work. So you're maybe drifting off, not being able to pay attention as well. So here, the all blue presenteeism is allergies. So if you're in allergy season, you might be familiar with the idea of showing up to work but having such bad sinus pressure that you're not doing your best. Number one here, sleep disorders. Depression, number two, linked to sleep disorders. Number three, fatigue, linked to um, shortened sleep. And the rest of these have all links to um, poor sleep too. So actually, sleep is a way that has ballooning benefits that if we invest in good sleep, other measures of health improve as well. Sleep is so vital to us, and sometimes I use this as a way to kind of explain how important it is. You might remember this from intro psychology. Um, sleep is at the base of our, of our hierarchy of needs. This is Maslow's hierarchy of needs. So sleep, like food and water and air, is something that if we don't have enough of, our body immediately starts to change its physiology for the worst. So can you imagine how you'd feel if you went with, say, 70% of the calories you needed, 70% of the water you needed? It's really bad. If we go for 70% of the sleep we're needing, we're only getting four or five, six hours a night, we have the same sort of of consequences in our, in our brains and physiology. So, I want you to think back to the worst sleep of your life. And I'm guessing for many of you, it's gonna be the same period as it was for me when you had a new little one enter your life. So, this to me is the sleep, um, looks so much like a hamster who's super chiasmatic nucleus has been removed. This is the activity um, rhythm for a newborn baby for weeks and weeks and weeks. And you see it's not till a couple months into a newborn's life that there's something resembling a circadian rhythm popping up, and that is exhausting for parents. The new parent loses on average 46 days of sleep in the first year of a child's life, so it's exhausting. Um, I measured, because I'm geeky like that, I measured my own sleep before I had a child, so this is right before I had the baby. I was sleeping nine, 10 hours a night, occasionally had to wake up to go to the bathroom. But then once my daughter arrived, I w switched to this kind of biphasic or like multiphasic sleep where I was up and down and up and down with her, and that was so hard to do. This has consequences for our body. Sleep deprivation is considered a threat to our body. Sure, we can do it, right? So we wouldn't survive as a species if we were asleep for eight hours and couldn't wake up, but it comes at a cost, and that cost is activating our stress system, the sympathetic nervous system. So when we don't get enough sleep, the body's like, uh-oh, there must be a reason for it, maybe a tiger marauding your village, maybe a forest fire. So I'm going to switch your physiology into emergency mode. And what that means is your heart beats faster, your blood pressure is more, your, um, your blood sugar spikes because your brain thinks that you need more sugar to fight the tiger. So just a couple nights of sleep deprivation and you are in kind of a physiological panic mode that Im impacts your brain too. So mood-wise, sleep is intimately coupled to mental health. If you don't have time to invest in sleep, your brain thinks it's because of an emergency and tries to make you extra anxious, extra depressed, extra sort of attentive and looking around, and the combination of that is really hard in our psychology. Um, a good indicator of how well you're doing is how well you're sleeping. A person with inadequate sleep is nine times more likely to screen positive for depressive symptoms. 17 times more likely to screen positive for anxiety symptoms. And maybe you're thinking back to a period of bad sleep in your life and what your emotional state was like. And this is actually a crisis state for many high school students with early start times, many um, college students who are just trying to kind of schedule so much in their life.
Bad sleep is also sort of heuristic. Many doctors are urging people to consider sleep as the fourth vital sign because bad sleep shows up before a lot of mental disorders. So before 50% of depressive episodes, before you have sort of mood disturbances, you start um, having strange sleep patterns in your REM sleep. 75% of manic episodes are preceded by um, extended periods of wakefulness, and 90% of suicide attempts, which is a leading cause of death in college, college students, is um, the second leading cause of death in college students right now is, is preceded by bad sleep. Right? So you can actually use that as a heuristic for how well are you doing? Are you able to go to sleep, feel well rested when you wake up? So what can we learn from the life and death of Elvis? So we want to look closely at Elvis' circadian rhythms, his zeitgeibers, the environmental cues, his drugs, of which there were many, and his homeostatic drive. How much did he need to sleep? And I want to kind of highlight two sources. Um, one is this really touching memoir, Elvis and Ginger, by uh, Elvis's girlfriend who entered his life the nine months before his death. So it's kind of a sweet um, reflection on the final year of Elvis. So Ginger Alden um, wrote this book from her notes about what it was like meeting and living with Elvis near the end. And in that book, I counted, she mentioned sleep and sleep problems over a hundred times in this short memoir. So sleep was a big issue for Elvis. The other great source material is a recent article that came out in Pain Management Magazine about, um, about Elvis and kind of looking back at the connection between brain injury and neuroinflammation, autoimmune disease, and his ultimate demise in drug use. So let's start with circadian rhythms. Um, I found it kind of ironic uh, that Elvis's recording label, who knows it, who knows it, Sun Records, right, um, was, is just a great contrast to how Elvis lived his life. So the circadian rhythm is supposed to be in sync with the sun, right? So Sun Records developed by Sam Phillips. Um, Sam Phillips was a farm boy, so he woke up with the sun, picked cotton, um, sang early, and was used to kind of the farm life of waking up a little bit with the rooster. And I love he designed this own logo as being such a central symbol in life, is that sun. But that is not one that Elvis paid much attention to. Elvis was definitely a night owl, as many, um, many in the entertainment industry are, either by choice or by necessity. Um, Elvis would host, um, have concerts late, late at night, beginning one, and he would stay up with his crew far into the night. So the circadian rhythm is actually pretty important for our physiology and is usually linked to the sun. So we have rhythms and rhythms and in fact, 5% um, of our genes in our body. So we have about 20, 30,000 genes in our body that are expressed and 5% of them are under the circadian rhythm. And I just want to show you some data from students about what happens if you have a schedule that's in line with the circadian rhythm, synchronized, and what happens if you don't. So this is data from one of my students who tracked her sleep every single day for a semester. Blue lines is when she's sleeping. She goes to bed around um, 9 o'clock. She's an early morning riser because she was an ROTC and a student athlete, so she had a lot going on. She always went to bed by 9, always woke up around 5 o'clock, sometimes 4.30, sometimes 5.30. There are two days that were off when she was traveling with her sports team, but otherwise a very, very synchronized rhythm. And when we look at her physiology, when we record her temperature day to day, her body temperature reflects that circadian rhythmicity. So her body is a, a machine of kind of perfection in terms of when are hormones being produced, when am I feeling awake, when I'm feeling tired, everything is synchronized. Now I want to show you a much more typical college schedule where um, when you wake up and go to bed is, is um, influenced by what, how early your class is, how late the parties are, sometimes you throw naps in, sometimes you don't. And look at that circadian, it's not even a rhythm, but look at that temperature. It varies so much day by day. And this sort of physiological shift is not healthy for you. It doesn't help with any sort of the functions of our body that are, are regulated, appetite, um, digestion, mood, etc. So Elvis was more like that. He was delayed in his rhythm, and his zeitgeibers weren't the sun. He didn't spend a lot of time outside, 
when he did, he wore these big eyeglasses because he had routine eye problems, glaucoma, eye infections. And his bedroom was so dark. So the last year of his life, he basically sat in his bedroom watching television, and his bedroom was super dark. He didn't have windows out to look at, so he wasn't getting light during the day, and he was getting too much um, kind of light at night. He also had the, the Memphis Mafia crew that who would bring him anything he wanted any time of day. So there was no such thing as breakfast, lunch, and dinner time. It was all Elvis time. So Ginger writes a lot about how strange that was for her body to kind of shift to um, whatever Elvis wanted whenever. As a society, we are having more and more light creep in at night, right? So this is in the late 50s. You could probably, if you're around then, look up and see the Milky Way. That's not something we can do for most of us these days. And it's estimated by 2025 we won't even be able to see the Big Dipper if you're living in one of the major metropolitan cities or the surrounding areas. So we as a society have kind of taken away the dark at night and had a lot of light during um, night, which is confusing our sleep. So much so that some great researchers wanted to see how much of our sleep problems could be fixed if we just went back to more of a camping lifestyle. So they took a couple dozen um, insomniacs and put them out and said, okay, away from Wi-Fi, away from electric light, see how you're doing, hike during the day, sleep at night. Lo and behold, their sleep problems were fixed in about a week of camping. They were getting much more light during the day, 10,000 lux rather than 1,000 lux if you're kind of working an uh, inside job. And look at this light at night they used to be getting before they went camping. And their body's hormones shifted too to be in sync with the sun. So living in our modern lifestyles is actually kind of doing a disservice to our sleep. Psychoactive substances. Okay, so Elvis didn't drink that much. He actually had bad reactions to alcohol. But like many soldiers of his time, he started using amphetamines, right? Um, we'll talk a little bit about that and how there's so many people caught up in what's called the stimulant sedative loop, where you feel so tired in the day, you need stimulants, and you feel so wired at night that you can't get to sleep without a sedative, but the sedative actually makes your sleep worse, so then you need more stimulants. Um, I, <laughs> my daughter was three when she asked me to play restaurant and asked, what would you like? Would you like coffee or wine? Um, so already at that point, I had shown her what a um, stimulant sedation loop was. Unfortunately for Elvis, his choice of stimulants and sedatives were much worse. His stimulants of choice were Benzedrine, right? So straight up amphetamine. He found them great for diet pills. They were freely distributed to um, in the army. And he just was really enjoyed that kind of wired feeling from high school. Even he had evidence of using those stimulants. Sedatives. This is a little harder. He, like many sort of people of his time with his resources, um, got addicted to sedative um, drugs, including opiates and benzodiazepines that are like super powered sedatives that don't actually give you sleep. When we say um, we're putting you to sleep for a surgery, it's not actually sleep. His doctor, Dr. Nick, gave him what's called knockout packets um, that would um, basically give him blackout drunkness almost instantly as sort of a level of anesthesia. And he overdosed on these actually four times before he died. So one of the problems with any um, depressant, whether it is an opiate or a typical sleeping drug or just an alcohol nightcap, is that it doesn't allow your brain to have this REM sleep period when you are under those depressants. It actually just kind of makes it almost impossible for you to achieve that good REM sleep, which is important for learning, for memory, and for emotional balance. So I just want to show you, this is kind of a student with a normal night of sleep. And this is a student who used a lot of alcohol before he went to sleep. So he goes into a deep sleep, which is more like anesthetic, early, wakes up, feels sick, and goes back to deep sleep, but doesn't really have that REM sleep, so you don't feel rested after drinking. All right, homeostatic drive, and I've got maybe three more minutes of slides, and then we'll take questions. Homeostatic drive gets at the question of why we need sleep, right? That's one of the great mysteries. 
So Elvis worked himself to exhaustion. He did everything in extreme, worked to extreme, stayed up so late that he actually had um, quite a bit of problems. We need sleep for the brain because sleep actually rids our brain of toxins, okay? This is a, a, an important kind of question to go over. This was recently discovered. Why we need sleep is during sleep, and specifically during slow-wave sleep, the channels of our brain allow almost like a cleansing, like a dishwasher cycle, a rinse cycle, a fish tank filter, if you will, that takes away the cellular waste products we build up during the day. So Elvis actually had a big decline from um, 1967 to 1977. During that 67 filling of clam bake, he had a really pronounced brain injury. He slipped on the tub, hit his head, was out for hours, probably had some internal bleeding that doctors now think triggered an autoimmune response. So in the last years of Elvis's life, he showed classic signs of traumatic brain injury, a triad of headaches, insomnia, and pain. So together, he also had confusion, mood, dis um, mood dysregulation, and impulsiveness. So what this did was this contributed to sleep disturbances. The areas of his brain that controlled sleep were damaged. With that sleep disturbance, he had a lessened ability for his brain to clear itself up of that brain trauma. That led to toxin accumulation, including beta amyloid, which is the protein that builds up in Alzheimer's disease. So he had basically building up of Alzheimer's disease proteins. That led to um, cognitive and emotional impairment. That together changed his lifestyle, where he didn't want to go out during the day. He felt like he needed a lot of drugs to regulate his sleep, which contributed to worse sleep overall. So that combination, what doctors think, is really what did him in. So I'm going to end with one quote from a physician, if I can. Oop. Uh, here we go. Um, so that kind of leads us to how we survive sleep deprivation. Get better sleep, basically. Number one, I hope you're not disappointed with the punchline. How do you do that? One, figure out if you have a treatable condition like sleep apnea. So most Americans who have sleep apnea don't even realize they do. So if you're during sleep, that's a bad sign. You need to have a sleep study and get that fixed. Your life, I promise, will be better. Second, how do you prioritize sleep? How do you make it a priority in your lifetime, in your day? And what are your zeitgeibers? I want to end with favorite psalm, weeping may endure for the night, but joy cometh in the morning. If I could edit the Bible, I would just add, provided he getteth sufficient sleep. So hoping in this webinar you learned a little bit more about how to control zeitgeibers and psychoactive substances to get better sleep, because when you do, it is fantastic. Awesome. Thank you, Dr. Pritchard. We truly appreciate you being here with us today. All right, Dr. Pritchard, the first question is, how did you become interested in sleep research? Oh, I think it's fascinating. So um, my advisors at UW-Madison, Mary Bean and Ruth Benka, were studying sleep. Um, one of the grants they were working on is actually a, a military grant to see how we can get soldiers to perform better under sleep deprivation. Just the topic is fascinating. Everybody does it. We're not sure why. It's beautiful. Awesome. Thank you. The next question is, if I am not getting enough sleep, what are some remedies I can try? Uh, I would suggest first taking a look at your bedroom. Is it dark, as dark as it can be? So light blocking shades are really helpful. What about your electronic use? Do you have something like um, flux or night shift on your electronic devices so you don't get kind of that bright blue light during, um, during the night, which can decrease your sleep? Uh, making sure your room is cold, so uh, 65 degrees or less actually makes a better, better sleep environment. Wonderful. And caffeine, so limiting caffeine and alcohol, say six hours before bed. Wonderful, thank you. The next question from an audience member is, does lack of sleep affect your lifespan, and if so, how much? Yes, um, so lack of sleep is unfortunately associated with a reduced lifespan. So evidence shows from large demographic studies from the CDC that you live longer if you're in that seven to nine hour zone. 
The next question is, if there is an occasional night where I can't get enough sleep, is it okay to take a nap? If so, what is the ideal nap length? Okay, great question. So naps, if, if you um, are getting enough sleep, an ideal nap is 20 to 30 minutes, halfway between your waking period. If you're getting too long of a nap, that can um, disturb your sleep. On a night that you didn't get enough sleep, I'd say it's fine to take a nap earlier in the morning until you feel rested if you have that luxury, um, but not too close to nighttime. Next question is, you briefly mentioned sleep apnea. I think my husband has it. Ha ha. <laughs> um, what are some remedies he can try to get over sleep apnea, or who should he go see? Okay, so you would want to call a sleep clinic. Often they have, um, you can find ways to do testing at home, which is a lot more affordable. So you, somebody would teach you kind of how to hook up electro, or um, hook up a heart rate monitor, blood oxygen, and you really should figure out if you are depriving your brain of oxygen dozens, hundreds of times a night. So if, if <sighs> that kind of sound, forgive me, <laughs> but that is definitely associated with the sleep disordered breathing. They make a lot of different options these days. You're probably familiar with the big um, mask that either kind of just goes in your nose, like nasal cannula or fits over your mouth. There are also um, uh, kind of oral appliances that can move like a retainer that just repositions your jaw so you can have better breathing at night. But a lot of Americans do, and if you uh, can't really interlace your fingers around your neck when you're going like this, chances are you probably might have sleep apnea. Wonderful. The next question is, do you have any additional resources about the impact of sleep on mental health? Sure, we have some publications. So if you look at our website, um, St. Thomas EDU backslash college sleep, we have links to some articles on sleep and mental health. And I can also follow up with some um, recommended re reading. Uh, the book, The Promise of Sleep, is a great one to start. Next question, do prescription drugs, for example, trazodone or Ambien, affect the quality of sleep? Yes, so none of those drugs, unfortunately, are approved for long-term insomnia. They're more for short-term, like are you going through something traumatic or grief that can help, um, but they're not approved for long-term use. So any of those sort of drugs, they kind of work similar to alcohol, where they are changing what's called your sleep architecture and your REM sleep is changing. So it's better, um, in head-to-head -head studies, it's better if you have insomnia to use sort of behavioral techniques or modification to your sleep routine rather than those drugs because they're associated with a lot of negative outcomes. Awesome. Next question, can an eye mask help or is it disruptive? Oh, it's great. I love eye masks. <laughs> um, so if, and they have a lot of different kinds. Some lay flat against your eyes and sometimes have these like pillows so you, so it, you don't feel it on your eyes. But that can definitely help you get good sleep by blocking the, the light. Next question is, are there any remedies to be able to fall back asleep easier after waking up in the middle of the night to use the bathroom or hearing a noise? So one thing um, I think it's helpful to understand is that it's not normal to sleep eight hours straight in a row. So I think a lot of people are anxious, like, oh, no, I woke up. Um, if you measure most people, they wake up a couple times a night and are able to go back to sleep. If you're not able to go back to sleep within 15 minutes, it's best to get up and do something kind of boring until you do feel sleepy again. Um, meditation, body scan, kind of doing some stretching can help people get back to sleep. But me, if I'm in that situation, I just go do something I hate, like sorting bills or something, and then I start to feel tired. Awesome. You kind of answered this question already, but they're looking for examples. Do you see any benefits or correlation between meditation and getting good sleep? And what are some examples?